Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I think it's the right time to start now. Uh, thank you for joining today's session, uh, HCAU Program Deep Dive on Global Healthcare. So um, I'll just like to quickly walk you through today's uh, rundown. So there will be two, two, two presentations today, and then after each presentation, there will be a short Q&A for you to ask any questions that you have. You can uh, talk to the speaker directly. Uh, we will invite you to either press the raise hand button to speak up, or you can type your questions. Okay. Uh, I'd also like to remind you that if you have uh, further questions, you can stay behind and uh, talk to us. Uh, So now uh, we, I will now pass the time to Dr. Brian Aoyang, who is the, uh, currently the Deputy Program Director for the BASC uh, Global Health and Development. So uh, Dr. Ryan Aoyang, are you ready? Would you start? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Nicole. So let me just start to sh share screen first. All right, um, so can you see the slides properly? All right. All right, good. So um, thank you very much for joining this session. So my name is Ryan Aoyoung. I'm the Assistant Professor and the Deputy Program Director of the BASC GHT Program, School of Public Health, Faculty of Medicine, Hong Kong University of Hong Kong. So today I'm going to give you a brief introduction uh, on a new program. Uh, which we have just admitted to the inaugural cohort in 2019. So after my talk, I will also have like two current students who will share their views, I mean, towards this program. So which will give you a bit more like a uh, understanding of the, of, the core of the program, I mean, from a student's perspective. All right, so um, nowadays people always talk about COVID. So uh, when we talk about COVID-19, people think about that as, say an infectious disease, uh, which has now spread to most I mean, parts of the world. Um, in the past, we always think of COVID as a health problem. Uh, that's why people always think about, oh, say public health, what is the health impact of getting infected by COVID, or like uh, what are the preventive measures that we can take to prevent COVID transmission. For example, like using face masks, uh, doing social distancing policies, or maybe shut down cinemas or shut down bars in order to prevent spread of diseases in the community. But nowadays, I mean, as you can see from the headlines that I extracted uh, from the news media, COVID-19, as an example, obviously have impact that is more than just health itself. For example, the first headline on the top left corner, I just said, what coronavirus could mean for the global economy. And this is what we saw, I mean, in the previous few weeks where we saw like um, the outbreaks of COVID-19 has substantial impact on say the economy. Uh, we can see that stock markets actually plummeted. We can see that there are concerns over recession, there are concerns over unemployment, and there are concerns over, over even the global supply chain because China, for example, is the first country that, is, that has like severe problems regarding COVID-19. Apart from, say, economy, of course, I mean, when we talk about, uh, say, societies in general, I mean, there is something called the infodemic. Uh, what we need to really be aware of is because of globalization, the spread of knowledge uh, has been facilitated by, say, technology and the way how different countries are connected to each other. Uh, but of course, I mean, as you will know, um, some of these info might not be correct. Uh, we have seen like cases where there are like uh, wrong information regarding like preventive measures that are associated with COVID-19 and of course that will have drastic implications regarding uh, the containment or the mitigation strategies that governments or international organizations can take to sort of contain this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, back in Hong Kong, we can see that uh, Hong Kong has also been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, as we all know that we're now doing all these e-learning activities right now. You can see that me wearing face masks and this has been uh, the case for 
the past few months. Uh, so, I mean, there are concerns like over like whether uh, all people in the society can actually get access to masks. I mean, we can see that the sales of masks or the price of masks actually went up substantially. And this actually brings out the problem of say inequity within the society regarding access to these essential products per se. Um, so nowadays, I mean, when we talk about things like this, which is of a global scale, uh, it's very difficult for just like one particular sector to work on this kind of problem. So as you can see on the bottom headline, you can see that economists and scientists are actually working together to deal with like the societal problems that are associated with COVID-19. And we can see that uh, in order to contain COVID-19, I mean, it's not only the job of the public health experts, but also the government, also the economists, also the uh, maybe the legal advisors, and also the participation of supranational organizations. So uh, a lot of the private companies are now trying to chip in, you know, to help combat COVID-19. For example, providing funds for research or providing like um, more advanced technology in uh, trying to facilitate the implementation of these uh, containment strategies like using drones or using like other advanced tech. And we can see that even for COVID-19, I mean, it also impacts things that might not seem to be directly relevant. For example, like the postponement of Olympic Games in Tokyo, which, should, which was supposed to be held uh, this year. And obviously that will have important implications regarding the economy in, to uh, in Japan in general this year. So I think the importance of interdisciplinarity uh, has been really explained, I mean, by the screen that you can see here. So uh, recently, Hong Kong actually hold, uh, held a virtual forum on Hong Kong's big ideas on combating the COVID-19 pandemics. Apart from the public health experts, we can see that uh, different disciplines actually can provide the role as well in trying to contain uh, this global issue. For example, people from the chemistry department, people from the mechanical engineering department, people from public health, from microbiology, and of course, business and economics. So I think this demonstrates the importance of um, being able to incorporate knowledge from, knowledge from different disciplines in order to deal with these kind of issues, which we anticipate that COVID-19 is not the only thing that we are facing right now. So uh, the reason why I brought up COVID-19 is because it is something that we, we all experienced. But uh, we are not just talking about infectious diseases. So COVID-19 is just one example demonstrating the complexity of global health and development issues. So for those who follow, say, United Nations, I mean, you can see that there is a sustainable, sustainable development goals. Uh, amongst these goals, you can see that some of them are actually complex issues. For example, no poverty, zero hunger, quality education, gender inequality, uh, climate actions, for example, uh, so on and so forth. So when we think of things like, say, climate change, um, obviously it's an environmental science issue, but the reason why we see climate change happening uh, in the world uh, probably is driven by uh, multiple factors. And that's why it's really important to understand um, why this happened and what are the potential ways to deal with these issues. And this requires interdisciplinary thinking, I mean, when we tackle these kind of problems. So that's why that leads to the development of our program, which is the Bachelor of Arts and Sciences in Global Health and Development. So what we're trying to do here in this program is to incorporate knowledge, from, not from just one perspective, not just from the science perspective, not just from the perspective of arts, or not just from the perspective of public health. So when we developed the curriculum uh, for this particular program, we actually took an interdisciplinary approach where we invited six faculties in Hong Kong, you, amongst which a lot of them uh, are, are like well known, for example, the law, the faculty of law, the faculty of business economics, faculty of medicine, of course, and other faculties in order to develop the curriculum, uh, in order to work out like what are the key issues that are essential for people to understand, I mean, if they want to study issues in global health and development. Uh, when we talk about education modes, apart from relying on lectures, which was the conventional methods done in the past, we also relied on, say, other modes of education, like tutorials, problem-based learning, and seminars, so that students can understand or to sort of participate in like, in like critical thinking exercises rather than just having like very didactic lecture type like exercise where knowledge transfer is more unidirectional. Apart from these uh, 
issues, I mean, we also have something called the core courses. Uh, we understand that competences is very important and has been one of the key elements that maybe perhaps like influence the probability of a, peop a person being employed in an organization. So that's why for the BSE program, uh, BSE students will be entitled to enroll into core courses like courses on leadership, courses on big data, and courses on foundation of knowledge to sort of improve their competencies, uh, which are not knowledge specific. Last but not least, our program, one of the unique features of our program is the overseas field placement, which is arranged by us. So for students enrolled into our program, they will spend uh, a total of six months uh, overseas to do a placement uh, in like organizations like UNICEF, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Young Foundations, WHO, etc., so that they can try to go into these places to work and then translate the knowledge that they gained in the junior years into practice so that that definitely improves their employability upon graduation. So essentially what we are trying to do here is to help you address the following questions. And in fact, these questions are, were being asked by uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Hong Kong U, uh, Professor Richard Wong. So uh, when we try to tackle global issues, usually we are trying to ask three questions. The first one is, why does it happen? And second, how could we solve it? And the third question is, what are we going to do? So when we talk about the first two questions, uh, essentially these are more like subject knowledge specific questions. So for example, when we think of COVID-19, then we might think of like, okay, why does it happen? It might be because of, say we have uh, all these markets which sells like uh, wild animals, which might have created uh, a vehicle for viruses to mix together to, uh, which led to the emergence of COVID-19. So when we move on to the second question, how could we solve it? Then perhaps there are multiple ways to do it. Should we try to do social distancing policy? Uh, should we try to ban all these markets? Uh, should we actually uh, penalize uh, uh, populations uh, who violate certain regulations, so on and so forth? But the most difficult questions that we always need to ask, and which is most important, is what are we going to do? And these are the questions, and this is the kind of questions that the government is always trying to answer. So governments are always being presented with multiple, say, um, information uh, from different perspectives. Some may say that we should do this. Some may say that we shouldn't do this. So how, how are you going to balance the pros and cons and trying to think of like, why are they proposing this option and why are the other groups proposing something that is totally different? And that actually requires you to really understand in their world and that alone will actually help you partly to come up with a solution that is agreeable amongst the stakeholders in the society to move things forward. So what are you going to learn in the BSC GHD program? I mean, the things that I said is quite broad uh, and it also involves some sort of things like related to competencies. But what we're trying to do here in this program is to focus on things that we believe is important uh, that is related to global health and development. So in this program, you'll be learning concepts and knowledge surrounding GHD. So for example, you'll be taking courses on architecture, which will be related to urban development. You'll be taking uh, courses on economics uh, to learn more about micro and macroeconomics and financing. You'll be taking uh, courses from law uh, to know more about say global health law or the human rights. And of course, public health is one of the cornerstones in say global health and development. So uh, in courses relevant to public health, you will also learn more about epidemiology and the general picture regarding the burden of disease at a global scale. At least you know like, oh, what are the key diseases uh, that have driven um, disease burden in the world, for example, like cardiovascular disease or mental health. And this will also help you sort of interpret findings from epidemiological studies, such as the ones on the right hand side on the slide. Uh, we are talking about science as well. So you'll be learning a bit on statistics and social science is obviously also an important discipline because we are in a society. So you'll be also taking courses related to population development and also politics. Um, apart from these like foundational knowledge, which you'll be learning, I mean, in your junior years, you'll be also learning things that are more specific regarding global health and development. For example, like health systems. When we talk about COVID-19 using COVID-19 as an example, we often hear a phrase saying that, oh, we should flatten the curve, flatten the curve. But what do we mean by flattening the curve? I mean, what we are actually referring to is like we are trying to uh, 
make sure that our health systems is not uh, jeopardized or like overwhelmed because of a sudden surge in the number of cases uh, of COVID-19 so that uh, the health systems can actually cope with the, uh, the, the increasing number of COVID-19 cases. Uh, we also talk about say globalization. Of course, this is a global health and development program. So, I mean, then questions might have like, oh, did globalization actually facilitate the transmission of COVID-19? Uh, so, I mean, you can see that on the headlines on the right, then actually people actually talked about the relation between globalization and COVID-19. And obviously, I mean, when I mentioned COVID-19 in the introduction, I also mentioned things about innovation technology and the role of private sector. So these are specific topics that we believe is important uh, for you to also understand global health and development. But apart from knowledge and specific topics, one of the key things that employees are often looking at is the competencies. And this is not something that is commonly discussed uh, specifically in, in undergraduate program. So in this program, we also focus on training on key competencies surrounding global health and development, such as leadership and advocacy. And this might partly explain why we see differences in the COVID-19 severity across countries, despite they are being exposed to uh, similar level of evidence. For example, the New Zealand has been praised of their excellent effort in um, tackling COVID-19, whereas in say other places like US, I mean, things might be more difficult to control. Of course, this is not simply based on differences in leadership or advocacy skills, but also based on the overall health system structures and the society in general. But obviously, if say, if the leader is poor, I mean, then that will have detrimental impact on whatever policies that are related, that are relevant to health and development. So um, this is a general structure of the BASC GHD curriculum. As you can see, this is similar to other conventional undergraduate uh, program, where it's four year program, where from year one to year two, you'll be doing uh, courses which are more focused on uh, foundational knowledge, so meaning that you'll be taking courses on from law, taking courses from economics, taking courses from social science. But when you reach year three and onwards, then you'll be taking courses which are more focused on specific topics, which itself is a complex global health and development issues. For example, how should we evaluate the role of innovation and technology in shaping the directions of health and development? Uh, people often talk about say big data, people often talk about say artificial intelligence and they have been implemented in many scenarios in, uh, including healthcare. So is it really a good choice for us to use AI and abandon say uh, standard clinical decision-making tools? Uh, so these are the things that we are going to talk about. Uh, and here for um, the most important thing is the capstone field placement, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a few minutes. So uh, before I move on to the field placement, uh, these are just some other special features uh, that are relevant to our program. Uh, overseas field placements, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Uh, international exchange opportunities, the two minor programs, the global health and, uh, global health and development, and the intercalation. So let me focus more on the overseas field placement because that's uh, from my understanding from the school talks that I had, uh, in the past is the was one of the most important attractions uh, to the students uh, coming to our program. So for this overseas field placement, this is a six months overseas field placements arranged by us. So meaning that you do not need to go out and look for your own field placement site. Uh, the purpose of this field placement is to gain exposure to real life GHG challenges, to put theories into practice and to gain practical experience and mentoring. This is particularly important because if say you have a lot of knowledge, but if you fail to know how to translate knowledge into practice, that's not really useful. I mean, from the employer's perspective. And myself, I'm trained in public health and I'm an epidemiologist. So uh, I teach say epidemiological methods, but in a lot of the times, I mean, I always see like students like who are able to come up with like, excellent plans in study designs. Uh, but then, I mean, the problem is that it's very, very difficult to implement. Um, by having this kind of field placement activities, I mean, this will actually help students to understand like what are the issues uh, that you propose, I mean, to solve 
a particular problem. And maybe this kind of solution is doable. I mean, for example, in developed countries, but this proposal might not be doable at all. I mean, in underdeveloped or developing countries. So um, the purpose of this field papers is to actually help you understand the key issues that um, you need to have, you need to be aware of when you put theories into practice. So uh, with regards to the field placement, uh, there are a lot of sites that we have already been in negotiation with. Uh, so you can actually try to select and pick depending on your interest and your career goals. For example, we have UN agencies, we have NGOs and we also have consultancy groups. So on the right hand side of the slide, you can just see some of the examples that we have uh, regarding the field placements like UN foundations, UNICEF, UNDP, international care ministry, so on and so forth. So uh, we have uh, more details, I mean, regarding this, uh, the list of capstone sites uh, in our own website, which I'm going to show you uh, at the end of my presentation. Um, so obviously from this field placement, you will be able to travel and get experience in like places all over the world, like USA, Geneva, Canada, France, and the Philippines. So what we're trying to do here when we select the field placement is to try to increase the diversity because we know that one size doesn't fit all. So it's important to really have a wide range of organizations in wide range of uh, settings so that uh, students with different needs can choose their most appropriate options for this field placement. Um, when we designed this course or this program, uh, surprisingly, I mean, this is, very similar to what the World Economic Forum uh, has posted, I mean, regarding the uh, top 10 skills that uh, employees are looking for. As you can see, I mean, on the left-hand side, uh, top 10 skills in 2020, uh, employees are actually looking for things which are more competency-based. For example, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, so on and so forth. So I think this actually echoes with the principle or the rationale for us developing this Bachelor of Arts and Sciences, uh, Bachelor of Arts and Sciences in Global Health Development Program, because what we, are tr what we tr are trying to do is to train students or train graduates, which are not just having particular knowledge, but also having the competencies to deliver uh, the, the given task. So with regards to career prospects, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our program just was just launched. Uh, in September last year. So uh, we, we don't really have like information regarding career prospects, I mean, in terms of statistics. But what we are trying to achieve, I mean, based on the curriculum development is to help students build a solid foundation in order to enter into a broad range of careers in technical, strategic and leadership roles in global health and development. So these may include analysts, associated consultant, executives, program officers, policy researchers, so on and so forth, in a wide range of organizations, like the governmental agencies, ministries of health and development, or like NGOs. So um, I think uh, this is particularly important. And um, that's why, I mean, the capstone field placements actually come into play, because if you're able to say, uh, do well, I mean, in your capstone field placement in a particular site, first of all, you have a better understanding of like, how it looks like, I mean, in working in that organization. And secondly, it might give you a higher chance in getting a job perhaps, I mean, in the respective organization. Uh, so I think um, this part is actually um, in concordance with the principle of the field placement. So I think that's the end of my presentation here. Uh, so uh, this is the contact details that you might want to uh, jot down. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can email us at ghdsph at hk.hk. Uh, you can uh, call us or you can just scan the QR code here, uh, which will bring you to the, um, to the program website, which contains much more information I mean, than what I just have just presented. So uh, as usual, we understand that uh, nowadays people often follow social media rather than just looking at the websites. So for our program, we actually created social media accounts uh, in Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So if you are uh, users of these social media platforms, so please um, feel free to follow us as well. Uh, what we are going to 
do usually for these uh, social media platforms is not just share things related to our program, but also share, share things in general regarding global health and development. So I hope that you may find the content useful. So uh, hopefully uh, this provide you uh, a brief background about our program. Uh, what we're trying to do here is to really train graduates or train students uh, to become leaders to help transform challenges into opportunities like uh, COVID-19 that we are facing right now. Um, so I think um, that's more or less it for my part. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, apart from me talking about the program, I also have like two current students uh, who will be talking about um, their experience uh, in studying the program. So uh, we will ask them to come out now. Okay, so Claudia, I think you're here right now, right? Yeah. All right, good. So uh, Claudia, maybe I'll start a question with you first. So why are you interested in this program? Uh, well, actually, um, uh, before applying for the JUPAS, um, uh, some uh, people from uh, the University of Hong Kong who, who were uh, responsible for this course came to our secondary school to mm -hmm. give us a talk on this program. And actually, at first, I was more interested in the social sciences programs, but then I'm also interested in some health issues. So uh, this program really fits into my interests, and I'm uh, very interested in the interdisciplinary uh, study approach uh, that was introduced by the people. So uh, I just wanted to find out more about how uh, I can learn to solve problems interdisciplinary uh, Lee, and to um, know more about the health issues happening around us in the world. All right, good. So how about you, Felicity? I just saw you coming in. Yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting how we got to experience got to learn from different faculties and we also get to learn an interdisciplinary perspective on perspectives on different social issues and really get to see the interrelations between different factors. Right, right, right. So what do you anticipate, uh, what are your expectations regarding the program? I mean, I mean, it might be a bit too, too early to answer this question uh, because you are just uh, nearly finishing your year one, but what are your expectations, I mean, from this program? Maybe mm -hmm. I'll start with Felicity first. Maybe to learn more about public health issues and how uh -huh. we can use policies to solve them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Since now, public health issues like COVID are more interrelated, they are interrelated with many different disciplines, so we, uh, the program really provides us with a multidisciplinary knowledge so we can really get to know how different factors play into public health issues. Mm. How about you, Claudia? Um, I think I would like to know more about um, how uh, each and every issue in the society can be solved with uh, different disciplines uh, by working together because a lot of times when we mention some health issues like the COVID-19, a lot of people just think about how we can solve this with some public health approach or maybe medical approach by using drugs or maybe uh, mm. some uh, quarantine methods. But um, actually these issues may involve a lot of other uh, disciplines that we do not notice uh, normally, for example, like the mm. mass media and social sciences, because mm. there are a lot of fake news spreading around right now. And that actually caused a lot of impact to the uh, current situation too, because people will like believe in this false information and have false judgments and become uh, panicky. So uh, I think it's very interesting uh, how um, an issue always uh, can relate to a lot of disciplines. and. Uh, uh, by studying in this program, I wish to know more about how we can adopt interdisciplinary approach in uh, every situation that we face uh, in the future. Right. So I think uh, this is very in line with, much in line with what we are thinking of as well. And I mean, frankly speaking, I mean, COVID-19 will definitely be appearing in the subsequent courses, I mean, in the program, like the globalization course. So I'm sure that you'll learn much more 
I mean, when you reach year two and taking the course on globalization. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the important things uh, that people are always interested in in our program is the capital field placement. So uh, we just had a field placement workshop uh, carried out earlier this week. So maybe I'll just take this opportunity to ask like, have you decided what kind of projects you want to work for or, or what kind of organization do you want to be placed into? So maybe I'll ask Claudia first. <coughs> so I don't really have a very clear uh, aim yet because um, I'm more interested in health issues um, and mm -hmm. especially in some non-communicable diseases because I think it relates more to uh, people's lifestyle and it requires a lot of effort to really change the situation right now because a lot of people are just not willing to change their uh, maybe some habits that will affect their health and that mm. uh, leads to the rise of the problem of NCDs in our world so uh, I think it would be a very interesting topic to um, uh, probe into and so I I guess I may prefer to have my field placement in um, some organizations related to uh, health uh, mm. like the UN institutions or right, right. something similar, yeah. Right, so I think, for example, like UN foundations and the international care ministries obviously covers health, but um, if we really look carefully into the, pro I mean, into the care organizations, essentially most, but if not all organizations actually touch upon health, I mean, either directly or indirectly. So I mentioned like international care ministries and this is, uh, for those who are not familiar with this organization, uh, is an uh, NGO in the Philippines, which tries to deal with ultra poverty. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in Hong Kong, we are fortunate enough to have like, access to clean water, access to uh, adequate food supply, and have like proper education, so on and so forth. So, I mean, sometimes, I mean, there's so readily available that we might take it for granted, but I mean, this is not often the case in like other countries, for example, like in rural areas in Philippines. So, I mean, for ICM, I mean, what they're trying to do is to deal with ultra poverty issues. And perhaps, I mean, that might be something that uh, students might want to look at. I mean, when, when we talk about health issues, because health issues in say developed countries might be different from the health issues that you can see in like different settings. So I'm sure that you will be able to sort of find out more what you want to do uh, because there's still some time for you to decide on what you want to uh, choose for, I mean, regarding the six month field placement. So uh, it's good to try to keep your options open and um, try to find out where you really want to get placed to. How about you, Felicity? Uh, I want to work more with charities and uh -huh. tackling poverty and homelessness, things like that, because I feel like it's very important to give back to society as well. So. Maybe I'll look at the ICM or the UN Development Program because they seem to touch on many of those issues. Right, 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 right. So charities obviously uh, are also important key players. So for example, we can see like all this philanthropies actually like creating all these grand challenges. And um, some discussions with the colleagues, uh, although, I mean, for our research, I mean, our funding mainly comes from say government, but sometimes, I mean, the time that is required, I mean, for the government to produce or to give out the money might be uh, more rigid compared to say private donations, for example. So obviously, I mean, these organizations would also have a role, I mean, in driving like global health and development issues. And it would be interesting to actually understand like how they actually do the prioritization. So why do they fund more on HIV or why do they fund more on say issues with regards to social determinants of health? And it will be useful to learn firsthand like how these charities or philanthropies actually work in practice. Okay, so thank you very much, Claudia and Felicity for sharing. Um, so uh, let's move back to the audience. So do you have any questions for us? You can type, I mean, if you prefer. Can we apply for four children? No, uh, so, so the semester actually starts in September. So I think and this is a yearly admission, so I think that might have addressed 
the question posted on the chat. Um, but to clarify, I think late round is possible at this stage. So, okay, so we have another question. Let me just take a look. Right, okay, so I'm asking, I, I'll try to answer, let me see. The, I'll answer the exchange opportunity question first. So um, the exchange opportunities is actually universal. So uh, in Hong Kong, you, I mean, there are, there is a dedicated like uh, dedicated um, department or like unit that deals with exchange opportunities. So um, regardless of whether you are in the BSEG program or in like other programs, you'll be open to the same exchange opportunities. Uh, but one thing that we would like to also emphasize on is because uh, the field placement is unique. So that's why um, it would be much beneficial. I mean, for example, if you choose to do your field placement in Geneva, then it might be good for you to also do your international exchange in Geneva so that you have a year long uh, sort of like overseas experience rather than like spending half a year in one place and half a year in the other place. So uh, let me see, uh, because the chat is running quickly, so I need to think, okay, sure. Uh, I think some students asked about the uh, requirement for subjects and this program do not have does not have like preliminary requirements for subjects. So meaning that regardless of, of whether you're taking biology or whether you're taking social science, uh, you can apply for this program. Uh, so I think some students also ask about say articulation uh, and there are possible options like masters of public health or say UC Berkeley public health or global studies in Geneva. So these are the possible options that students can take, uh, which we believe is important because that links up well with the um, with the Bachelor of Arts Sciences in Global Health Development program structure. So math subject is not compulsory. Can, see. Yeah, Cantonese is not required. I mean, some people ask about languages. Um, we actually welcome like students um, who are non Cantonese speaking, so it's fine. I mean, we do not require students to, to be able to speak Cantonese in order to get enrolled into the program. Uh, but it's useful. I mean, if you say you really come to the program that is useful for you to really learn Cantonese so that uh, it's easier for you to live in the city, and there are a lot of courses offered in the fact in the Hong Kong uh, in Hong Kong U, which allows you to uh, learn Cantonese. Okay, uh, I'm trying to read through the questions. Um, some people, uh, some students, ask about transfer arrangements for MBBS, and currently there are no such arrangement. Uh, I think some people also ask uh, about the procedure of application admission, and I think they, uh, colleagues at AAL would be at a better position to address those. Okay, any questions? Let me see.
ah, some uh, one student asked like, what kind of students am I, uh, are we looking for? So what we are trying to look for is students who are able to work with each other and will be able to try to think of things outside of the box, but not like too far away, of course, but uh, most importantly, to be able to think from multiple perspectives. So for example, we might be asking students uh, what are their views towards one particular issue and it'll be good, I say if the students are able to think of issues that surrounds different aspects, but not just focusing on one particular area. Okay, so uh, I think some students asked about the timeline for 2021 admissions. Uh, the applications will open in November 2020, as of now. Uh, I think some students asked about MBBS, but I think uh, those will be addressed in the next section. Um, yes, interview will be required. Uh, some students asked about like whether interview process is required and that's yes, uh, because what we're trying to do here is to ensure that there's a good match between the student's profile and the, um, and the program objective. Uh, ultimately, I mean, we are just recruiting like not a very large cohort. I mean, partly because of the field placement uh, where we try to focus more on like getting like placements for students. So uh, the interview process definitely counts. I mean, when we consider whether a student is eligible for our program. Uh, a lot of students ask, ask about the admission status and you can actually ask uh, the GHG office, um, they will be able to provide you with more information. The interview format is simply just uh, interview, so there will be no writing test. Um, normally, it would be face to face, I mean, with regards to the mode of interview, but now, I mean, we have this COVID-19 situation going on. Uh, it's quite likely that the interview will still be online. Okay, so any more questions? If not, then I think I'll conclude. Oh, so there's one more. Let me see. Okay, so some people ask about the, uh, the master program. So, um, I think depending on like the master's degree is a requirement, uh, but my guess is that it is possible, but you need to check uh, regarding the requirements of different master's program. So, um, I mean, that's usual and applicable to all master's program. So not just specific to the GHD. Uh, some people ask about the interview details, uh, like uh, who will be asked to do the interview and we will give priority to interview candidates who place us on the first choice. Okay, so I think because of time, I think uh, I'll stop here. But in case if you have further questions, you can always send us email or just call our office. Um, so the email is ghdsph at hku.hk. So thank you very much again. Uh, stay safe and remember to keep your hand hygiene and all sorts of things to control the transmission of COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, so um, everyone, I think uh, Dr. Gordon Wong is now ready to share with you. So uh, Dr. Gordon Wong is the Assistant Dean uh, professional development for the HKU Faculty of Medicine. Yeah, so today he will be sharing with you uh, uh, the MBBS course. So uh, Dr. Wong, are you ready? If you're ready, then I will let you take over. Okay, we are... 
we are forever ready. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this Hong Kong U deep dive program. And uh, wherever you are, I wish that you are safe and uh, healthy. I promise you I was ready until someone else dis derailed me. Okay, so wel welcome uh, to this uh, brief presentation. Just as a starting point, I just want to tell you the, our, the birth history of our uh, medical school. In fact, it's quite old. It was uh, initially born as a Hong Kong College of Medicine for Chinese, established in 1887. And uh, in fact, it's older than the university itself. And our first two graduates uh, include uh, the, our uh, father, uh, Sun Yat-sen, who was granted a diploma of uh, medicine qualification from, uh, from then the college, but now the university. When the university was born, uh, formed in 1911, uh, the college was incorporated within Hong Kong U as his first faculty. And now, in uh, 2020, we were now 133 years young. Okay. In this time, uh, we managed to uh, obtain quite a number of achievements. For example, um, we performed back in, 1990, back in 1990, before most of you were born, uh, we did our first bone marrow transplant. And uh, all the way to uh, 2013, we were also first in the world to characterize the um, epidemiology of then the H7N9 virus. So we were, uh, in, in our history, we were first to achieve quite a number of milestones in medical um, circles. And more recently, and some of these uh, people you might recognize, uh, we now exceed, excel in uh, surgical uh, achievements, in uh, stem cell research, in uh, pharmacology, and here it is for AIDS, uh, drugs for AIDS, and also um, our research facility, uh, it's world-class to be able to help with um, uh, research into uh, flu drugs using genes from the virus itself. So what we like to uh, tell you is that we're not too bad on a worldwide scale in terms of our rankings, okay? So everyone wants to look at a report card and this is how, uh, what the type of report card that we look forward to. It's uh, what we call a, a ranking of um, medical schools. So we are in Asia, we're ranked fourth behind uh, National University of Singapore, uh, at Tokyo University, National Seoul University. And all these three universities are national universities and uh, they are well, highly well funded. And we are fourth and our sister school is somewhere uh, in the forties. Another measure of the performance of medical school is the amount of research funding it is able to attract. And one of our um, sources of uh, medical fundings is obviously uh, research fundings from the government. And you can see that the amount that we attracted uh, in the past years uh, exceeds that of our sister school. So that's the background of the medical school and its uh, overall performance. Now I'll go more specifically into the Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery program. Start off with some statistics in the coming year we are planning to admit 265 students. And this is from previous last year, the median score of admission for students who set the IP diploma was 43. And that of uh, A level, a 4A star. Okay. And uh, just a reminder, I noticed uh, some participants were uh, asking, we require chemistry uh, at a high level, if you choose to take it, um, at a, if you're studying IB. And chemistry is the only pre-requirement for medicine. 
Next, I'll tell you, give you a brief overview of our, the structure of our curriculum. It's a six year program. And in the first year, you're gonna have a, a more gradual uh, introduction into the art and science of medicine as a starting point. And after that, in the second semester, you begin on what we call system-based studies in various blocks. We arbitrarily divide the human bodies into a number of systems. And you will be studying each of these systems from multiple points of view, how they work, what they are, uh, their anatomy, uh, their physiology, and their uh, biochemical um, uh, reactions within those systems. At the same time, you'll be uh, required to fulfill some of the university courses because you're granted, you will be granted a degree at the, at the completion by the university itself. There are some requirements uh, issued by the university that all graduate, graduating students must complete. These include um, proficiency um, in core English and um, two common core courses. So in, at the end of your first year, you're gonna have a summative exam for which you must pass to proceed to the second year. In the second year, you will be uh, diving deep into the system blocks where you study the remainder of the human body uh, in five blocks. At the same time, you still have to fulfill another common core course and there will be a, a course for practical Chinese. So to make sure that when you enter the clinical years, you'll have enough, uh, your Chinese is good enough to be able to deal with patients. Again, at the end of that year, there'll be a, a, a summative exam. Again, uh, you have to pass that to proceed to the third year. As you might have uh, heard previously, our third year has now been restructured into a, what we call an enrichment year. It is a, um, uh, a very fun-filled learning opportunity uh, year, which I'll outline in a moment. Upon finishing third year, you will now enter the more uh, clinical orientated part of the curriculum and in the year four, five, and six. Upon return to medical school, you will be uh, uh, starting a clinical foundation block where we introduce you to a, a number of aspects to, towards clinical education. Then you'll be embarking upon a junior clerkship where in rotations, you'll be joining teams on the, on the wards in various specialty. In the first rotation, you'll be doing mainly internal medicine in second rotation, you'll be joining the various surgical specialties. And in rotation three, you'll be uh, joining a number of uh, smaller specialties. And then you rotate through each of these rotations. Uh, again, uh, we just want to make sure that you're equipped uh, in, uh, language wise so that we have a uh, English for clinical clerkship course as well. So here you'll be uh, learning from teachers, uh, clinical teachers, as well as um, having some uh, lectures as well. At the end of the fourth year, again, you'll have to fulfill a summative exam to proceed to the fifth year. Now, fifth year comprised of a senior clerkship. Now, this is a, uh, in the same style as your junior clerkship, but you'll be uh, exploring each disease entity in more detail, and you'll be um, learning more about the management of the conditions. In a junior clerkship, you're more uh, focused upon taking history, examining, and learning about the disease, uh, the, the characteristics. In the senior clerkship, you'll be more focused on the management and treatment. Now, our fifth, at the, uh, end of the calendar year, um, you'll finish your senior clerkship. So in the January of the subsequent year, you're still technically in year five, but you'll be starting your specialty clerkship. Now here you have seven rotations. Again, uh, you'll have another uh, round of medicine surgery. Um, and now in addition to that, you will have uh, uh, experience in pediatrics, psychiatry, family medicine, orthopedics, and uh, a number of smaller specialties as well. 
So this will take you all the way to around February the next year. And then you have a period of revision after which then you have the big final exam. Now this takes place uh, usually around uh, March and at the conclusion of exams, you have one month of what we call medical electives where you can choose to spend four weeks in a specialty of your interest where you want to maybe find out more about the specialty to see whether you want to choose it as a career path or to gain more experience in, in an aspect that you have interest in. After that, you uh, will enter what we call pre-internship uh, block. This is a, a three-week uh, program mandated by the Medical Council to help you transit from being a student into being a, a working hand in the health system as an intern. That's an overview of the structure of the curriculum. Now, the way we like to uh, train our medical students is uh, through variety and diversify learning approaches. Sitting down and just listening to someone talk at the end, at the other side of a computer or even in a large group setting uh, in itself is good for certain knowledge transfer, but for solid, deep learning, you require a number of different approaches. And here we use um, a number of um, what we call blended approach uh, learning with uh, e-learning videos. We have interactive, uh, online interactive forums for case-based discussions. And then we also have a, a different number of different SWORS group teaching uh, formats. We'll have practicals, meaning that uh, you will be in a lab, maybe doing some uh, laboratory procedures. There are clinical skill sessions where we will uh, teach you certain examination skills for patients in a simulator environment. We also have simulation teaching where you will use advanced equipment to simulate certain clinical scenarios and you work as a team to solve the uh, diagnose and solve the uh, medical problems. We have a, a more traditional problem-based learning where we'll get you to sit down as a group and to solve a problem uh, and help um, learn from each other where the teacher is there to guide you only and not to provide the answers. Of course, there's uh, the traditional bedside and uh, bedside teaching and teaching clinics. Over the past two years, we've been slowly building up the e-learning resources of the faculty. And uh, we'll be, we have been uh, tailor making e-learning videos using uh, our uh, local um, professors in a local setting. We have a number of uh, clinical examination demonstration videos, and we have some self-learning uh, exercises at the end of these uh, um, uh, videos to help you and reinforce what you have uh, watched on the videos. And this is one example of a clinical skills platform where we arrange the different skills that you should have uh, for uh, acquired for various different uh, specialties at different uh, years. And we also rate or give you an idea of how proficient you need to be at that skill. For example, some skills, some advanced skills, you just need to be um, aware of what it is or what it involves. But some skills, you have to perform them independently by the time you graduate. So we'll have all that available online. So we think that having a flexible learning approach will give you a, a far more enjoyable experience and uh, it enables you to learn more at your own pace. And for able, uh, it also enables you to revisit the teaching material uh, at various times throughout the year. Mentioned before, the third year is what we call an enrichment year. This is, has been a, uh, it's still a relatively new initiative. It's been, uh, in that we have almost completing two years and the third year will then, will then uh, leave uh, this August. Now, what is enrichment year? Our, it's been recognized that a lot of medical students uh, go into medical school straight from high school. And being a very intensive program, they don't have a lot of time to really uh, diversify their, their experiences and to uh, develop other skills other than uh, being in an academic setting. 
So uh, three or four years ago, we decided that we should broaden our, our medical uh, students' experience to be a little bit more like uh, students from other degrees where they can go and exchanges with uh, uh, other university and other institutions. They are able to do more what we call service learning or experiential learning. So we decided to restructure our curriculum so that we carved out one entire year where students can choose or students can create their own learning experience. It is not a, what people would think is a, of a gap year where they don't do uh, any academic uh, endeavors. Rather, the enrichment year is a very structured learning, um, uh, has a very strong uh, pillars of structure so that students can choose their own activities within um, various frameworks. We want students to uh, sort of enter their year or enter, design their learning activities under these three umbrellas. One is the service and humanitarian learning. And now one is uh, for research uh, attachment. And thirdly, is in pursuit of another uh, academic uh, achievement, rather it would be a full degree. It could be an exchange program and it could be um, uh, taking up a minor uh, within local in, uh, locally at Hong Kong U. Go through each one of these in, in more details. Now uh, in our 2018-2019 uh, cohort, we managed to have 173 students who spent at least part of the year away from Hong Kong. And of those, um, we had students visited uh, around 23 countries or regions and uh, across four continents to do uh, a combination of uh, uh, studying for further degrees, uh, research, attachment, or service and hum humanitarian work. Student, 21 of the students uh, did chose the, uh, this option of uh, serving uh, the community. Uh, they lined themselves up with a number of uh, well-known uh, non-governmental uh, organizations. And we're proud to admit, uh, to tell you that just about all of these um, programs uh, were initiatives of the students. Of course, uh, the faculty have a lot of partners but uh, uh, with uh, service institutions, but a lot of the students from the first cohort chose to, cho uh, chose to work in an area which they're passionate about. And they actually went to um, contact the relevant organizations and set up the whole uh, experience themselves. This organization experience we think is invaluable to medical students or to students in general. That cohort also had 28 research projects and many of them were carried out in world-renowned research institutions. Uh, the Karolinska Institute, Imperial College for, and UBC, for example. With the intercalation, uh, we have 141 students uh, choosing this uh, option. And 64 degrees were awarded at the end of that year. That includes uh, intercalated uh, degrees or master degrees. And 53 of them were from high ranking universities such as Cambridge, Ox Oxford and Yale. We thought it was a great idea. What did the student think? And these are some of these um, unsolicited uh, comments uh, from the students. Constance here, who spent six months working on a mission, uh, mission ship, operation mobilization. And in her words that the enrichment year has been a life-changing journey of self-exploration and global ex exposure. She did another six months of exchange in Sydney University after her, um, her work in El Salvador. 
other feedback? Um, Cyrus, who did uh, research at Yale University um, to do with a blood uh, bone marrow disease uh, called multiple myeloma. And he says that the enrichment year gave him the chance to learn how to troubleshoot interpret data, research data, and especially when faced with um, unexpected results. And for people who are uh, uh, Vernus here, who did an uh, exchange program at uh, Yale, which was actually organized through uh, Hong Kong U. And uh, she was extremely grateful for that opportunity, so uh, for exploring her interests in fields beyond medicine. So the students, we had positive feedback from the students. We also had recognition from the university for this um, program so that uh, we were the fortunate enough to be recipient of the innovation award uh, for from the university. Okay, so that's the enrichment year. Apart from learning and experiencing, uh, our faculty have taken initiative to make sure that as a student of this faculty that you are well looked after, not just for uh, academic uh, uh, purposes and not just for uh, your uh, performance, but rather we want to look after you as a whole, as a person as a whole. And we recognize that uh, studying medicine can be stressful and can bring forth challenges that you haven't anticipated in, in high school. So a couple of years ago, we set up a, a student well, a wellness counseling service, which is in-house, meaning that uh, it is within the Faculty of Medicine and students do not have to travel uh, to the main campus should they need some help. And so we're able to uh, provide confidential counseling if you so need to need it. And proactively, we try to build up the resilience of our uh, medical and uh, healthcare students by conducting regular mental health workshops and uh, giving you tips and tricks on how to stay uh, emotionally well uh, throughout exam times or, or other stressful uh, situations. And for those of, uh, those of the students who actually need a little bit more help uh, medically, they refer to uh, uh, medical uh, mental health professions people who are well uh, connected with our faculty so that you will be looked after in a confidential and professional manner. While in university, there's more to life than just studying and uh, we strongly encourage students to participate in uh, student societies and in ex what we call extracurricular activity. And there are many, many ways that uh, you can get involved. For example, you can choose to live in a hall where you will then be a, a, a really truly a part of a community and there's various hall activities. We have inter-hall competitions. There are other outreach activities that is organized uh, as in that group. And there are many uh, in-house sort of cultural activities uh, that you can choose to participate in. And here just got some representation that uh, a lot of very musically inclined students who tend to choose medicine and they form their own groups singing and band and they can participate in, uh, in their own sort of ensembles and orchestras. And there's plenty of opportunity for those who are more sports inclined for them to join uh, university and faculty sports teams. You'll be glad to know that uh, we have uh, refurbished our learning space uh, recently. And these were open just a couple of months ago before the COVID-19 virus. Therefore, uh, now it's relatively empty, but we anticipate that these will be uh, uh, filled with students once teaching resumes. And you notice that we wanted to have a lot more open space where students can gather and uh, exchange ideas and 
people, students from different years will be able to meet together so that to, to support each other and just have casual conversation and incubate uh, ideas and get um, support and help from each other. And throughout the university now, we realize that it's better to have open spaces where students can gather and uh, have more flexible work uh, study environment. In addition to those spaces, we are actually expanding quite a lot of uh, uh, other teaching space. And uh, this will probably be uh, progressive, uh, uh, progressing throughout your time in Hong Kong U. Okay, so that's the learning environment. Now, most of you have joined this afternoon because you want to get in. So it's important for me to um, remind you of the admission arrangements. The way we, se uh, we select our medical students is based on a combination of their academic performance and their performance at our interview, which takes place uh, in the form of a multiple mini interview. This uh, format has been adopted over the last uh, three years or so. And it, it is a, um, what we think a more objective way of uh, interviewing our students. It comprises of six stations of different domains. The, each of the station will have a two, uh, will last six minutes uh, after which you rotate to the next station. And we ask you questions in, um, in terms of your ability to think critically. Uh, there will be an ethical question, a general knowledge question, and there will be a task or a question that assesses your communication skills, your abstract thinking, and your personal insight. So after two minute reading time, you will have four minutes interacting with the interviewer after which you rotate to the next station, etc. Okay, so that's the uh, multiple uh, mini interview. Finally, I just want to uh, tell you that as medical, uh, as a medical school and as future medical practitioners, your real work starts when you interact with society and your real work truly uh, makes an impact when you start changing the lives of those in your community. And as a medical school, we try to do that as, a, as an organization through providing uh, uh, services that will help the community at large to deal with uh, diseases or conditions which, which affects them. And we have uh, constructed a number of uh, uh, resources for those who are um, interested in getting more information about the COVID-19. For example, it's a real-time dashboard, which is available at this website, um, which is a platform that shares the latest scientific findings and the um, implications for uh, public health policies on for COVID-19. And you'll recognize that this is our dean, who is also a world expert epidemiologist. And this is our dean of our um, School of Public Health, who was a, a Director General, uh, so Assistant Director General of the WHO. Also, we have uh, a, a number of online learning facilities where we community at large may be able to enroll in to learn more about uh, certain diseases or certain uh, epidemics. And for those of you who wants to uh, pass on uh, messages through uh, regarding um, health, we have a number of uh, health graphics that you can uh, download and pass on to your loved ones through social media. And you can always stay uh, in contact with us through following us at Instagram. Okay, so lastly, um, we wish you that uh, uh, to stay healthy and safe calm throughout this uh, period and for those who are waiting uh, your uh, results. And also um, 
yeah, to make the most of your time at home. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Wong, for your sharing. So I think uh, all right, so time now is for Q&A and student sharing. Okay. Yeah, yeah Q&A is in the moment. Hi, can everybody hear me? Oh dear. Okay, so I'll start now um, in terms of the student sharing. And to begin, I'll talk a little bit about um, the class schedule. Um, Ah, okay. So, um, generally speaking, school is from around 9.30 in the morning to around 4.30 or 5.30 in the evening. Um, there are generally around two to three lectures in the morning and um, practicals in the afternoon. And the practicals range from physiology, microbiology, anatomy, clinical skills. Basically, it's much more hands-on in the afternoon compared to the morning. And on top of that, you have to complete your common core requirements. And um, the faculty will carve out time for you to go to the main campus where you'll take these common core requirements. And I saw in the question session, section just now in the chat that some people were asking about what the common core requirements are. Generally speaking, they're non-medical related courses that are provided by the um, main campus. And it's a good time to just study some things that you might have been interested in previously or um, just non-medical related stuff. But then I'll move on to the PBL um, kind of um, section of HKU. This is obviously a very characteristic feature of the HKU MBBS system. Um, and it's something that a lot of universities worldwide are starting to adopt, especially in the UK. And personally, I see three main benefits. Um, the first one being the opportunity to apply and integrate knowledge that you acquire from lectures and practicals. Um, so generally speaking, you'll go through the lectures and practicals first before you do the PBL. Um, and in that, for that reason, it's a really good time to consolidate your knowledge. Um, secondly, it mimics a real process of diagnosing and treating patients. So if you guys aren't aware of what the PBL kind of process looks like, you'll sit down in a tutorial group of around 10 students with one tutor in HKU, and um, you'll be given the first sheet. And generally speaking, that'll be the patient, um, their chief complaint, maybe their age, some basic information. And you'll be given the opportunity to discuss what you think might be wrong with the patient and maybe some treatment options. And um, in the second page, they might give you um, more information, maybe some lab findings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's very much similar to how you would deal with a patient in real life, right? A patient won't come in telling you what's wrong with them. You'll need to come up with a differential diagnosis. And as a result, the PBL is a great way to transition from clinical, uh, non-clinical to clinical years. And thirdly, it gives you an opportunity to work with students from the whole cohort. Um, I came from a school that was very small before. My high school was a cohort of 40. So when I went to med school, that was a cohort of 250. So PBL, these PBL sessions, because they changed your groupings from different semesters, um, it's a good chance to meet students from maybe outside your common social circle um, and to meet everybody from the cohort. And if you look on the left, you'll see a picture of um, my PBL group from last year. And after exams, we went out to Soho to get some pizzas and with our tutor as well, actually, to celebrate um, the end of year one. Um, now moving on to extracurriculars and campus life. Um, the extracurriculars and campus life things a lot of people are interested in because a lot of people know that the medicine um, curriculum is obviously very demanding. But like 
um, what Professor Wong said just now, there's plenty of opportunities to get involved. You can obviously get involved with the clubs and societies within HKU. Um, you could also get involved with hall life. Um, there are two main different types of halls per se. Um, one's a very traditional HKU halls. You might have heard of St. John's, for example, or it's something like the residential halls, which have less traditions per se because they have uh, a shorter history. However, it certainly creates a sense of community. Um, or you could take part in some volunteering opportunities, which might be provided through the faculty or through some societies you'll um, start to begin to um, get familiar with, for example, AMSA. And you might be able to do elderly home visits, mobile clinics, ward visits, or even volunteering opportunities that aren't necessarily related to medicine directly. Um, you could also take part in internships, whether abroad or local during the school year, outside the school year. It depends on what you're interested in. Um, if you look to the picture on the left, you'll see um, me and a couple of MBBS students last year. We all went to Vietnam together during summer to do internships at a very local hospital in a very rural part in Vietnam. And we were working in the OBGYN department that, in that picture. You might also explore Hong Kong if you're a local student. You might start to explore trails, hiking trails that you never knew about before. Or if you're an international student, it's a great time to learn about the city. And lastly, you might pick up new hobbies with your friends. Um, I personally and a couple of other students from year two MBBS have taken up boxing in a local boxing gym um, in Kennedy Town nearby um, the medical campus. And lastly, I would like to just quickly touch on in the enrichment year. Um, Professor Wong obviously already talked about this in depth, but this is just much more in a student kind of perspective, perhaps. So there are a lot of different opportunities, um, like intercalations abroad, whether this is a master's in art, science, bioethics, or another bachelor's of science you might want to do, or you might want to stay in Hong Kong to do the really great MPH or MBRES programs. You might do exchanges, volunteer work, or you might do a self-initiated activity. Um, so I'm in year two right now, so I'll be embarking on my enrichment year um, in the coming academic year. And I personally will be going abroad to London to do um, a master's program. And at the end of the day, regardless of what you choose to do, it's the enrichment year is a chance to discover new interests um, and further develop old ones, especially ones that you thought you might have to give up on because of how demanding med school is. But yeah, that's pretty much it from me. So I'll pass it on to Ryan now. So uh, can you guys hear me? Is that, is that all right? Okay, cool. So uh, thank you, Harriet, uh, for giving us a good summary of what it is to be in the preclinical years. And I'll just mostly focus on um, the enrichment year for today. So let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, first off, just a little um, warm welcome to all of you for showing up today. And uh, my name is Ryan. I'm currently in the year four um, of the MBBS program at HKU. So today I'll be mostly focusing on what the enrichment was, enrichment year was, uh, which was last year for me. Uh, so first off, um, as Professor Gordon Wong has already covered, um, there's a, a, a lot of flexibility with what you guys can do throughout the enrichment year. Uh, you can either choose to do one whole um, module for the entire year, or you can divide up into two semesters and engage in two different projects. So I went with the latter option, and this was a, just a quick uh, timeline of what I did last year. So for semester one, I first uh, did a lab induction course that was two weeks long at HCU, which covered the basics of uh, research and also laboratory work uh, before I engaged in a research slash attachment program at the Department of Ophthalmology under the HKU uh, med school. And then by for the second semester, I was abroad in Sydney, doing my worldwide exchange program at the University of Sydney before I returned to Hong Kong in June of 2019 to continue with uh, um, my MBBS program starting my year four curriculum. So just to go over what I did in my first semester. So this is um, Grantham Hospital. As some of you may know, it's a smaller hospital in uh, near Ocean Park. And this is where the um, 
most of the Department of Ophthalmology of HNU is situated at, and this is where I spent most of my time doing my data collection and also attachment. So my project was actually on uh, dry eye disease, and the, the, the gist of the project was that we came up with a new questionnaire uh, to assess patient symptom severity, um, which is a very prevalent problem here in Hong Kong, dry eye disease. And what we would do is that apart from the survey, which collected this subjective data of how patients were um, feeling about their symptoms, we also did some objective data collection. And um, we would recruit patients reporting dry eye symptoms at the Grantham Hospital, and we would assess them using the keratograph machine shown here. And this is, uh, there are a few features of the machine, but essentially it can uh, assess features such as um, tear film breakup, which is shown here, as in like which parts of your cornea are more dry compared to others, uh, bulbar redness, like how red your eyes are. And these are, these provide objective measures for us to correlate with the um, data we collected with our surveys. So under the supervision of uh, Dr. Shi, uh, I had a partner and between the two of us, uh, we did three literature reviews throughout the period and two of which were eventually published in uh, medical journals, as you can see here. And aside from um, literature and academic work, we also did some clinical work. So because ophthalmology is a specialty that isn't really covered in preclinical pre years, so it was very fortunate for us to uh, just see how Dr. Shi was able to go around um, collecting, uh, doing history taking, um, ocular examination, and also um, and basically his treatment of patients in the Grantham Hospital. And aside, besides that, we were also fortunate enough to uh, visit one of his colleagues in the Hong Kong Sanatorium Hospital. We went into the operation theater to witness how LASIK surgery was done. So for the second semester, um, I kind of did three different uh, introductory level courses at the University of Sydney. So as you can see, they're not very uh, medicine related. And that was also what I was trying to go for because I knew I've spent the first few years of university doing a lot of medicine related stuff and I'll continue to do that in clinical years. So I decided to just diversify a bit and go for something else. And basically as besides the academic work, I've also um, met up with several other uh, fellow HKU students from other faculties. So like uh, they were doing business administration or arts, et cetera. And we would just hang out and bond in uh, Sydney. And besides the HKU students, I also joined a local church community where I kind of met up with a bunch of locals and other foreign exchange students. And we would have gatherings weekly and go on hikes together. And um, as you can see here, this is um, just a snapshot of some of the food we cooked up at dinner. Uh, because even though I have lived in a student hall in the first few years of uh, the, the MBBS program, but you wouldn't really have much time to cook in Hong Kong and it's just so convenient. So it was a great experience and opportunity to get to learn to prepare your own meals uh, and cook for others as well. And actually this uh, photo here was where I was paired up with uh, a fellow HCU alumni as part of the mentorship program. So uh, it was a pediatrician who actually graduated from HKU um, MBBS as well, but uh, several decades back, obviously, and he kind of moved to Sydney and it was just a great experience bonding and sharing with him and finding out what life in HKU was for him back then and how his life different now that he's moved to Sydney, a whole different environment. So besides that, I would also um, do a lot of short weekend trips to other cities in Australia. And I also went on an Easter trip to New Zealand, as you can see here. So there was a lot of hiking, essentially. And we also went on tours with strangers we've never met before. So that was an interesting experience as well. And another part was the cultural um, immersion, where we would go to Australian football games and go skydiving and also cafe hunting on the weekends. And um, besides that, it's a lot about uh, being independent, doing your own trip planning. And I've also kind of taken up photography as a side hobby of mine throughout the um, exchange period. So that's pretty much it for my enrichment year experiences.
Okay, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Harry. This is the first time I heard Ryan's experience, actually. He, he didn't know I graduated from uh, Sydney University. Anyway, um, now we open up the session for Q&A. Uh, we welcome uh, questions, you can type it out. Direct them mostly to Ryan and Harriet, please, because uh, you have uh, less opportunity to access these students. Okay. You have to excuse me, there's a lot of typing going on here. Okay, there's a question about um, second chance scheme. Uh, how would those candidates uh, from, the, from that scheme be interviewed? And they will be treated like any other um, non jupus uh, interviewees. So they will be again uh, interviewed. Uh, they will be interviewed uh, through the MMI um, process, and they will be selected on uh, on the same grounds as other postgraduate uh, applicants. Uh, what kind of work experience will be required or recommended? I presume this is to do with uh, uh, work experience before coming to medical school, or is this uh, from if you are from uh, high school applicants? Hopefully, uh, it, it was legal for you to work where you wanted to work, but um, in terms of getting experience before coming to university. For those coming from high school, we recommend that you may choose to ch um, join up with one of our uh, summer broadening programs from other medical schools. And uh, there are often programs which are run by individual hospitals where they will, um, where they actually uh, open it up for student volunteers. Reason we suggest that is that you'll get a taste of what working uh, doctors' uh, experience are uh, you get you can get to observe them uh, at work, and sometimes that's enough to put you off applying for medical school, and sometimes it will really encourage you and uh, inspire you to work even harder to get in medical school. All right. Uh, when does the procedure start for 2021 non jupiter applicants? And uh, that will, by that, I, 2021. Sorry, I just had to con consult my brain trust who's sitting all around me with all the answers. They, um, so far, you know. oh, sorry, uh, October, start checking out the websites. Uh, we will be probably opening applications around then. But times is a little bit more difficult to predict this year because of the COVID um, disruptions. Okay, I hope this one's directed at me. What type of students are you looking for? Uh, not directed at Ryan or Harriet. Okay. Now, um, obviously, we want someone who actually um, is passionate about serving other people, who have, uh, who's not going to faint at the sight of blood or guts or poo or vomit, because these are very important things. And so, uh, we want people who uh, is able to work hard, 
and we need a certain level of academic uh, performance but I keep telling other people you don't have to be the smartest boy or girl on the planet to do medicine you need those for physics and astro scientists for us we need someone who can um, be reasonable so they can understand a lot of the concepts in biology and biochemistry but more most importantly we want people who can connect with other people we need people who can speak who can communicate you can empathize and sympathize with the patients and uh, most above all we want someone who has a heart to serve without that uh, it's, it's kind of meaningless to be a doctor in some ways you can be a research scientist if you're, uh, you want to look for cures and things like that but uh, I, that's what I would look for but uh, we always obviously have uh, a very well um, set up procedure for interviewing you and for assessing your academic performance Okay. Is Cantonese required for MBBS for international students? We require at the interview, we assess your Chinese proficiency. Um, obviously, obviously, you need um, to speak Cantonese uh, to pass your MBBS. But uh, for those of you who have some background in Mandarin, for example, we trust that you will be able to pick up the language over the course of your first three or four years. But in the clinical years, you really require to be able to speak to patients and get histories from them. What AP courses do you recommend in high school, tech in high school? Uh, okay. Like everything else, we need uh, like every other program, we need uh, chemistry. Okay, so that's only a uh, prerequisite. Okay, Harriet or Ryan, this one's for you. What is the workload like in the program? Maybe I can talk about the clinical year, uh, non-clinical year, sorry, since I'm in that, and then Ryan can talk a little bit about his non-clinic, his clinical experience, sorry. Um, so like I said, I'm currently in year two, um, and I have to say year one is a good transition from high school to university because the first semester is focused on not necessarily med related topics per se. It's more ex um, appreciating medicine, um, the biochemistry behind it, um, maybe some basic knowledge. So that's a good transition. And then it's only in semester two you start to do the block the system blocks and because of that arrangement the workload is slightly heavier in year two which is obvious probably better since you're getting used to and settled in terms of the university experience um, your new study styles etc etc but I'll pass it on to Ryan to talk about the clinical years yeah so um, I would say the clinical years is quite different from pre-clinical years you would feel very different from uh, the other majors, students from other faculties, et cetera, because even in, um, in the preclinical years, maybe the workload is a bit rougher than every other major, but you would still find parallels. There's still a lot of lectures, uh, tutorials, and it's still one big classroom and everyone just sits there for the, entire, for the entire day. But clinical years is quite different because sure, you still have a certain amount of lectures. So for example, in um, year four, the junior clerkship, you would be you would have around 130 something lectures in the entirety of the year. And um, but the different thing is that all of your teaching will be done in the hospital setting and the faculty wouldn't expect you to really um, be a student as much. They would expect you to be kind of a doctor in the making. So even your kind of study hours are very much matched with the work hours of doctors. So for example, uh, we're looking at uh, five point five and a half days of school per week so we would have to come in on a Saturday morning for classes as well and obviously your summer and Christmas breaks will be a lot shorter than uh, pre clinical years but overall I'd say it's quite rewarding because you get to kind of fully put your knowledge to uh, application rather than just doing everything off books and uh, sometimes in pre clinical years you do have the problem of you 
perhaps you don't find much meaning in what you're studying. It seems like you're just memorizing and you don't really get to apply, but a clinical year is kind of like a, an ongoing internship for three years, I would say. Okay, thanks for that. Another question for uh, Ryan and Harriet. How do you balance your work and study life? Do you want to start, Ryan? Uh, ladies first. Ladies first? <laughs> okay. Um, so how I balance the work, the work and fun kind of life is very much similar to what I did before. Um, when I joined med school, I thought I would have to give up a lot of my previous hobbies, for example, but that just simply wasn't the case. Um, in fact, I picked up new hobbies. Um, and currently, I live in a residential hall. Um, I've been living in Chisan for the past two years. Um, and as a result, a lot of my post-school hours are spent with a different group of people um, in the residential hall. Um, it's very international uh, with students from a lot of different faculties. Um, and Chisan, for example, does a lot of volunteering work. Um, and that actually includes like ward visits, but it also includes other stuff like going to um, elderly homes, maybe giving out different kinds of things during different festivals. And on top of my whole life, I continued my other hobbies. For example, um, I did boxing even before I started med school and I continued with that. It's just a matter of maximizing the amount of work you do um, when you're working and so that I can have fun um, after that. Ryan? Yeah, so I think um, Harry was correct with, on that. So basically, you don't have to feel like you have to give up everything once you're in uh, med school because obviously the workload is tough, but there are always people who can manage and still persist with a few of their hobbies that they really uh, like. So I guess, first off, maybe a good thing to do would be to kind of shortlist what you really want to do and uh, keep on doing throughout med school. So that will help narrow your interests and really help you keep them on going on. And secondly, I think something that is quite important is the um, adjustment of your mindset and mentality once you get into med school, because I feel that um, in my conversation with a lot of my peers, we feel that um, in high school years, whether you're doing the CSD or IB or A-level, you kind of can't help but be in a constant mentality of competition because you feel that, oh, there are only so many med schools out there, there are only so many spots, you have to meet a certain score to um, get into medical school. But once you get to medical school, I would say you have to, it would be helpful for you to adjust that mentality because in reality, everyone can pass in med school. You just have to meet a certain standard. It's more of a competition with yourself rather than others. You're not trying to test anyone. We're all just trying to be competent doctors and we can help each other out throughout the journey. And in fact, a lot of us have study groups and etc. Your PBL is a good starting point. You can work together, and that's very important. And I guess just know that there's a certain standard of um, quality and knowledge that you have to meet that is expected of us by our professors and the community. But at the same time, don't feel too pressured into knowing everything um, once you're in year one or once you're in year four, because the journey of medicine is just so long. And there, to be a specialist, you have to have one for example, another 10 years of training on top of um, MBBS. So don't feel pressured to know everything and don't feel disappointed or um, sad because sometimes you feel like you can't memorize everything. Thank you very much for that. I need a bit of time to uh, recuperate from all the questions. Now, I've noticed there are certain themes running through the questions. One is to do with the interviews. So I might just uh, give you an overview. The interviews, the six questions, five of them will be conducted in English. There'll be one conducted in Chinese. There'll be the one that's conducted in Chinese may change from interview to interview. But during that Chinese question, we will assess your ability to communicate. First, uh, if, you can, if you can answer in Cantonese, we'll let you answer in Cantonese. If you know Mandarin, we'll let you answer in Mandarin. Now, if you cannot answer in either, 
we will uh, make a note of it and it will be part of your score for your interview. Okay. So if you do outstandingly with the rest of the, uh, uh, of the interview, you still reach a certain score. And depending on how well your other uh, um, fellow interviewees do that well, you may or may not make the cutoff mark for that year. However, if you know zero Chinese, as in uh, you have not much potential of developing proficiency at a conversational level in three to four years, I would strongly recommend you ch choose not to study medicine in Hong Kong because you're just making things terribly difficult for yourself. Because as I mentioned before, as Ryan will probably appreciate now, you actually do need Cantonese to communicate with patients, communicate with other workers, ally health workers. And so without that uh, communication skills, you're going to suffer. You're going to be very difficult for you to pass the exam and if it would be able to pass at all. So that's the MMI course. And how do you MMI interview? How do you best prepare for MMI? Like you, there are no content specific questions, meaning we're not going to ask you how to cure COVID-19, how to produce a vaccine in six months. Rather, we want to test your non-verbal skills, your critical thinking, your abstract thinking. And the most important way you can commu uh, prepare for an interview is practice your communication skills. You can uh, pick a random stranger and strike a conversation up with that person and see whether you can communicate a thought across to this person, obviously with a mask on and social distancing. However, um, we, we actually, we want to see whether you're able to re relate with people. So how you make the other people feel while you're conversing with that pe uh, person is also important. So we'll work on your mannerism, your demeanor, your uh, vocabulary. And um, for example, you, one way that we may ask you to uh, test your abstract thinking, maybe give you a, a picture or a, a scenario and ask you to comment on it. So you can practice that by commenting on things that you haven't, you normally wouldn't look at. Go on the internet, search for random images, and then try to explain to your little brother, explain to your mother what this image means. In Cantonese or in English, you can do both. But the training is for you to be able to um, uh, describe things that you not normally be able to describe which is a very important skill in medicine because often you see diseases, you see signs in the patient. You have to describe them in order to communicate with other practitioners. So that's the way to do the interviews. And if you're kind of introspective and kind of shy, you have to work on that because uh, we want doctors who can communicate in general. There are doctors who cannot communicate and uh, they're, they're, suited, they're suited to certain type of specialties, but as you're going through the uh, training in uh, medical school, you really need to be able to communicate with your students, with your teachers, with the patients. Okay. Now, other questions are, again, the, the Cantonese question is really more, not as for us to stop you from coming in, but it's more a choice that you have to make of where you want, want to practice and how are you going to get through medical school if you cannot speak the language in which um, patients communicate with you? Okay. There was, there's a question. What are your plans post-graduation from Hong Kong U? Uh, I don't know why that, that was typed up. Uh, Okay, there are questions that um, uh, to do with sort of, um, mature age student and uh, the uh, postgraduate students uh, applying for uh, app applying for medical school, and as a just an overall statement, we look at every applicant. We look at their uh, qualification. Uh, for postgrad students, and we'll see where what what the qualification actually is. So, in what topic, uh, what subject area, where they got the um, 
uh, qualification from, so what, what university, which school, and how well they did in that um, uh, program, and then what their work experiences have been subsequently. And on the basis of that, uh, because we get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these applicants, on the basis of that, we, we select them for uh, an interview as a, and then while, and they will be interviewed in the same batch as the non jupis candidates. Now, oh, there's a question. The Faculty of Dentistry is not planning to accept international applicants this year. Will this apply for BBMS? Sorry, I'm just consulting my cheat notes. BBMS. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, it could, could, could be a typo. Uh, it's probably MBBS rather than uh, BBMS. And um, we accept med uh, international medical students, provided they can speak uh, some form of Chinese. So we are not doing the same as the uh, Faculty of Dentistry, I guess. Okay, when there's a question to do with uh, when will we know exactly what it means by flexible arrangement for students affected by the COVID-19? I think that refers to uh, the assessment of uh, your performance from your exam that you didn't take for A level and IB. We're still working on that. We're still gathering some statistics and uh, knowing that our Dean is an expert in calculations and epidemiology, he wants the most scientific method possible to make it fair to everybody. Um, so this is gonna take some time. Okay, it's a question about as a summer clinical uh, summer broadening program I held online this year and someone's applying for 2021, would this put you at a disadvantage as I do not have hands-on experience? Uh, that's a emphatic no, you're not disadvantaged. Okay. Uh, if my age is larger than normal, students, my requirement would be more demanding than the others if I use A level. Uh, that's a pretty specific uh, question. Um, we, age is not a factor per se in when we assess uh, your criteria for interview. Oh, okay. There was a couple of questions to do with um, where you get sent for clinical placements. We have a, um, a network of hospitals. By and large, they are uh, the HA hospitals on uh, both Hong Kong side and on the Kowloon side. And uh, in your junior year, so uh, in fourth year, you'll be mainly at Queen Mary Hospital. In the fifth year, you'll be rotated to a number of different hospitals um, throughout Hong Kong. And then in the final year, there is also, you, you spend a small amount of time in some of the private hospitals, uh, but, but that's a very short uh, uh, experience, but they will become increasingly uh, uh, opened up. We have another affiliated hospital at Glen Eagles and we're working on uh, programs there where we can get students who go and visit the hospital and attach there. Uh, in the past, uh, we also had students going up to Sunjin Hospital. That's temporarily been put on hold, but I, w I will assume that with, when COVID is uh, under control, we'll uh, resume that program. And there's been a couple of questions about late applicants. Because uh, the late applicants, we, we're processing in, in batches, 
and uh, for those who qualify for interviews, we'll invite you in due time. But uh, we have, don't have a uh, exact timeline for those because it's uh, what we call a rolling um, application where people can keep applying up until, I guess, the day before school. But uh, uh, because that the numbers are so unpredictable, we want to batch um, process some of these applications. Okay. Okay. So it's actually harder than it looks going through a group of questions. Um, In fact, I think I answered most of them because a lot of them are very similar. So in that case, I might bring this uh, uh, session to an end and we'd just like to thank Ryan and Harriet. Ryan is a very uh, dedicated member of our student body who's been uh, helping us at no end for attracting students to our school. And Harriet will take over her, his role, I guess, when she goes to fourth year after enrichment year. And we thank uh, all, the, um, all the people who took the time out to listen to us today and I uh, wish you a very good evening. Bye-bye.